Hi, I'm Sean Martinbro. I am a comic book illustrator and uh, a commercial artist, and I'm here at the University of Michigan Stam School of uh, Art and Design. I'm here to walk you through my process of translating a script to a layout. I'm a big film and TV buff, so a lot of times I like a cinema, uh, a cinematic approach. So I will, I like a sort of widescreen panels, which allows me to sort of get more information and depth in the panels. If you're doing like a, a quick read through of the script, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. You just have a random person who looks very noirish, sitting outside of the state theater. I've just, I've gone through the script and I've done a really quick uh, thumbnail layout of the panel, and then I will really closely follow this when I draw my final page. And what I do is I use a light box so I can kind of trace. To me, I always find it interesting to use depth in whenever I design my panels, I like to have things in the foreground, in the middle ground, and background. I think it just makes for a more interesting composition. Uh, then you have the close-up, so you kind of want to have like a shot of him maybe turning uh, as he crosses the street in the script, so that would be like the street behind him. I'll follow the script the way it's written and just sort of have the character looking up. And this is like the sign of the establishment at an angle. And then for the final panel, they have our main character sitting inside the establishment. Also another uh, detail of my process with doing layouts is that I use a correction pen. I go back in and I usually clean up the drawing even more by using white. And really this is just to sort of make it look a little bit more presentable and clean. Boom, there we go. I hope you guys found this uh, helpful and inspiring and uh, go out and create some stories. Well, hello. Well, hello. Hello. Well, hello. Well, hello. hello. <laughs> Welcome. I got to I got to fix this, you guys. <laughs> Can't you put it down at the bottom? <laughs> I have to just change the whole the whole algorithm. I'll get I'll figure that out for the next show. Welcome everybody to Pencil to Pencils, your favorite pandemic podcast. I'm Jamar Nicholas. That's Mike Manley. That's Brett Blevins. Say hi, Brett. Hi. Say hi, Mike. Hi, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Gracie. Um, Pencil to Pencil, as always, is brought to you by good friends over at Clip Studio Paint created by the people at Graphicsly, and also our second sponsor, Tomorrow's Publishing. Uh, please go uh, on and uh, promote and buy from either of these great places. Uh, your support is always welcomed. Oh, look at that. You're doing that, uh, you know that tourist thing where people like stand in front of the Eiffel Tower and like go like oh, this? Right, <laughs> right. That's kind of what you're doing. Um, thanks everybody for uh, having us back. We uh, had the Fourth of July off. <laughs> if anybody was paying attention, we hosted a watch party, a pencil to pencil thon, Brett and Mike, where we did twenty four hours of past pencil to pencil episodes. Wow! Uh, Is it all sped up? Like <laughs> we have done so much content since April. It's bananas. I and I, you know, with uh, the help of some of our penciliers, our our regulars, picked some uh, penciliers or pencil tears. The pencil tear. Um, <laughs> picked some of the favorite episodes, and we played them like Walton Weezy's a favorite, uh, the Mike Norton episodes a favorite, the Steve Conley's a favorite, uh, Kazoo. Uh, was also a good one. So it was fun. And I hope that, you know, we can do something like that in the near future. For Christmas. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. And we'll just have like, I'll, you know, somebody will shake their dandruff over the screen while it's going. Um, so, <laughs> so tonight, you guys, uh, we're back live. We have a very special guest uh, in the green room. Uh, my good buddy, Sean Martinbro. Sean is, if I could call him an elder statesman of comics, and I don't mean elder as an age, I think Sean is like one of the unsung heroes of the art form who's been doing amazing work for so long and is really forward in, in the middle of things, promoting uh, uh, all of the, uh, the art forms in its different fashions. Uh, he's had a TED Talk on YouTube uh, he's very prolific and, and likes to have his face out in the public. And 
I think we're all better for it, having a very well-dressed person representing comics. We need more of that. <laughs> so I just wanted to have him on tonight, and we'll have a really good conversation. Everybody, Sean Martin, bro. Hey, Sean. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, were you, were you leaving? <laughs> Wait for one second here. Ah, okay. oh, sorry. Computer went to sleep. Sorry. Oh, that's all. Yeah, like I saw you looking for the exit. I was like, oh, please don't leave. We just started. <laughs> what, after that intro? No, no, no. I'm, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad I could help. So thanks so much for being on, man. I know you're a busy man, uh, uh, as we all are, but I you know, reached out to you a couple of weeks ago, hoping you wanted to be on the show, just so you know, we all have a chance to talk to you and talk about your work and what you have coming up next, and just talk about your your uh, mastery of the of the craft. So, oh, what I'm going to do before you guys get started is, uh, for people who are new to the stream, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, hello, from Facebook, hello. If you have a comment for Sean or the co-host, please type it into the comments. Uh, and I'm going to be monitoring the room. So let's get started. All right. So, uh, yeah, Sean, uh, tell us uh, what you've been up to lately. And you don't have to spill any secrets. What's on your plate? Um, you, you know, um, I, I just finished wrapping um, a project for Comixology and Delcor called uh, Promete 1313. Um, and that was a, a really great project I was working on with Andy Diggle, who was adapting a uh, a French comic book by the name of Promete, which had like 13 volumes. And um, the, the Comicsology and Delcor people had reached out to me like last year and asked if I'd be interested in working on a sort of prequel English adaptation for the States. And so, yeah, and so when they told me that Andy was going to be doing the the – the writing um, and I, I uh, Jock was going to be doing the covers. I was like, Oh, awesome. Because I worked with Andy and Jock back when they were doing the losers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm big fans of those guys. And Andy and I had worked together for years on thief of thieves for skybound. Um, and when they asked me, um, Hey, listen, you know, uh, who would you want to color you? I was like, all right, can we get Dave Stewart? And, and they were like, okay, that'd be great. And I reached out to Dave because David colored me when I had done a, short story for um, Mike Bignola and, and Hellboy, and he signed on. Um, and so it, it was a really great um, team. And, you know, I'm totally blanking out on our, our letter. I'm so sorry, man. Simon Boland. No, is it Boland? Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, so basically Simon. I'm pretty sure it's Simon. Uh, uh, please don't kill me, Simon. But, yes, anyway, so I was working on that for, like, a, a good a good amount of time. And then I wrapped that, uh, and now I'm working on my first creator-owned book for Abrams. And it's something that I'm writing and drawing. It's called The Heavy. I'm pretty excited about it. This is, like, a contemporary crime noir set in New York in Paris with a jazz theme. And I am working with John Workman doing lettering, which is – mind-blowing experience because I grew up on John's, you know, letters and he's such a, uh, an amazingly talented, such a generous guy. And so to see him translating my script into, you know, panel, like panels and word balloons and, and, and sound effects is just mind-blowing. And then I'm also working with my buddy, Christopher Sotomayor, who is, even though the book is going to be printed in black and white, there's going to be spot red colors like Sin Ooh. City. So nice. Chris Soto is doing like spot red colors and it's really amazing. And this is going to be for John Jennings new imprint Megascope, which is going to be published under Abrams books. So I really have been focusing all of my creative energy, energy on that. And there are a couple of few other things that I'm, I'm working on that I can't really mention, but that's like the lion's share of like my, my uh, creative focus now, which is the work behind me. Mm. Um, has the the quarantine changed anything in your life uh, artistically or even like in your studio practice? Well, aside from my sister reminding me about the joys of eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and then I just binged for like a month straight and I was just like, whoa, all right, chill. It's, it's <laughs> funny, be, it, you know, it's funny because, you know, the road is really, it's terrible and, and people are getting sick and dying. 
But the whole quarantine thing is not that different from a typical artist deadline life when where we're stuck in the house and you're looking out the window and seeing people like having a good time and you know we're yeah. trapped in the house. Yeah. Um, the wacky thing is, is that um, I was since I work I was working on the heavy and I was working on the script for that and it's a it's a 160 page script and I literally was just coming I I turned it around and I literally was just coming out of a self-imposed hibernation writing the 160 pages and like and I, I turned in my first draft in like mid February so I was just coming out of my hibernation when everything started closing down mm-hmm. and and I'm in the DC area and a lot of times when I'm kind of done with a project or I meet a deadline, I go up to New York cause I'm a native New Yorker and I go up to New York to visit my, my family and friends. And you know, that was out the window. So for me, this is, it sucks because I usually try to go to the gym just since we sit on our ass all day and you try to get the blood flowing mm-hmm. and then I go to like a movie or hang out and not to be able to do that as, as a way to kind of decompress. That's been kind of a challenge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, even I know it's, it's kind of tough because just thinking about the quote unquote lifestyle of a cartoonist, I think people think we all just hang out at diners all afternoon, you know what (laughs) I mean? But really it's, it's, yeah, it's a little bit of column A, column B. I think just not having the option to leave kind of changes the, the, the frequency a little bit on everything. Um, like, I don't know how quarantined you are. Like, or have you been just like, I'm not going to the supermarket. I'm not leaving the house or are I, you a little more. No, no, no. I'll go to the supermarket and I've been like, you know, getting takeout from like, from like my regular places. Um, you know, go to the gas station. But in terms of like hanging out, that's out the window. I had a buddy say, Hey man, you <laughs> like, I think he did it like, like last week. He was like, Hey, you want to go? You want to go get some dinner outside at a restaurant? I'm like, hell no! What are you kidding me? I was <laughs> right. like, I, I appreciate the offer, man, but that's that's not the kid. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not doing that. And when they talk about the movies, and he was like, well, what about uh, another friend? Was like, are you, well, you gonna go see Tenant if it comes out? I'm like, you let me know how that is. And I'm a big Chris Nolan fan, but you know, you let me know how Tenant is. I'll wait for it to come out on on the Netflix. <laughs> no, 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 not not the kid. No, uh, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, just, uh, just today, like I had, uh, I was on the phone with one of my uncles and he was talking about going to the dentist. I'm like, wait, is it open? Like, I'm not yeah. going anywhere. <laughs> like, I'll just hold it in. Like, I'm not going to any place <laughs> where I'm like trapped with a, with a, with a person like breathing well, in you, my face. I tell you, it's really weird because it's like, I, it's just the way things kind of happen. It's like, I kind of did these major, well, things like going to the dentist right before this hit. So I got like my yearly checkup yeah, like in January. And so I think I might be due to go back there like around August or September, but you know, like I kind of like deal, I even went to like, got some, I got some suits tailored and I went to like Macy's and bought some stuff like right before everything <laughs> shut down. So I was like, you know, yeah. Cool. You yeah. got it right but, under the wire. <laughs> but, 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 but I do try to go out. Like I, I'm always posting pics of me biking because that I've, I've always been like an avid biker anyway, because it's the cheapest form of, form of therapy and, yeah. um, you know, just sort of to keep the, the blood circulating. So mm-hmm. I, I'll like, you know, ride around the district and see stuff. And, you know, since we have the protests and all that other stuff happening here, it's, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, okay. That's like right along my bike route. So I like yeah. you just kind of, go see what's going on, get some exercise. And yeah, that's pretty much the extent of the outside get, social. Go get a lung full of pepper spray and come home. Hey, ready to <laughs> work. You know I, I missed it, man. That, that went down at night and I usually go by there during the daytime. So it's real. When I saw that, I was like, I was right there. Like I know exactly where that is. I know exactly where all that stuff went down. When you walked over to the church, I'm like, I was just freaking there. Yeah. So it's really kind of weird. And a lot of, it's funny because when I post the photos on social media, people, <laughs> everyone's like, Sean, be careful, be, be, be careful, be, be safe out there, you know? But, right. but I tell people, you know, I've been living in DC almost like 20 years and DC is almost like the protest capital of the world. Like there's always protests going on here, you know, and, and they usually close down streets for like the, either parades or different, you know, protests or whatever, or, or marathons. So that's not really a big deal. I think the biggest change 
is the whole increased military presence that, you know, Trump is sort of put into effect. That's like the, the new thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, getting back to comics, I want to, you know, I usually uh, ask uh, <laughs> to kind of start at the beginning. <laughs> What's so funny, Mike? <laughs> avoiding, the transition. <laughs> avoiding, avoiding the sand trap and getting back to comics. Getting back to comics. <laughs> um, is uh, yeah, I want to. I want. I wanted to. Oh, I always ask the guests and Mike and Brett can chime in, kind of about like what your origin story is. But I think it might be interesting to kind of like go backwards, like let's Benjamin Button it. Uh, and I know a lot. I think you may have, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Created like a whole new generation of fans off of Thief of Thieves. Hmm. Um, so like, uh, you know, maybe if you could talk about that project and how it came to be, and you had a really long run on it and maybe talk about, have some notes about that. Yeah, I think, God, I think that was like 2010. Um, I got an email out of the blue from Robert Kirkman mm -hmm. and he was like, Hey Sean, uh, you know, big, big fan, I'm doing something new. It doesn't involve zombies. I'd love to work with you on it. You know, um, you know, are you interested? And it, it was funny because at that point I had never read the walking dead comic. Um, I, I, I was aware of Kirkman because he had done this infamous YouTube video where he was sort of railing against Marvel and DC for being bankrupt of ideas. And so that's where I knew him from. I was like, okay, I, I remember watching that and that was pretty, pretty funny. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was like, yeah, cool. Yeah. Let, let's, let, let's do it. And it was Thief of thieves. And, um, I, I remember shortly after I agreed to do it, it was maybe, I think, a couple of months, maybe like two or three months before the show dropped. And he was going to be in the, the New York Comic Con and they were going to be pushing, you know, the, the Walking Dead. They were promoting the show and because the show was going to drop like right around there. And I went up to New York. He's like, yeah, you got to come up and, you know, we'll, we'll, we can meet in person. I went up and I, I um, you know, met him. Really cool guy. And. I remember seeing the booth because they had the Walking Dead booth. This is, and they had like all these hardcovers, and the hardcovers were just flying like hotcakes. It was like thirty nine ninety nine a pop, and they were like boom, boom, boom. And I was like, okay, this might have been a good idea to work with this guy, you know, on on, on something. And then the TV show came out, and then boom, it was off to the races, you know. Yeah. And um, it was it was fun to sort of create a universe from the ground up, which is you know in terms of like the visuals and the characters and the, and the looks and stuff. And that was really, really fun. And, um, you know, working with great, great writers like Kirkman and Nick Spencer did the first arc and then James Asmus did the second. And then Andy Diggle came on um, and then did like the, the following three arcs. Um, Felix Serrano did the first round of coloring for like maybe like the first three arcs. And then Adriana Lucas came on. Um, and then we had Russ Wooten doing lettering. So it was just a really, it was just fun, sort of just sort of like, you know, creating, creating, you know, working on this project and, you know, he left us alone and let us create. But also it was fun to sort of, sort of watch how The Walking Dead just became huge. So when I would go to conventions, you know, to promote Thief of Thieves and, and you know, just being there in, in the wake of it. And, you know, and Brett was saying how, how we met at, at a skybound party and you know there were like 40 people there and that's pretty much a lot of times when they would do conventions they would have these big sort of you know dinners and and and, and all these tie-ins so it was really interesting watching how kirkman kept the comic book going on but then the machine of the tv show was just going crazy and then the then the merchandise was just exploding and seeing how they were really managing that was, you know, for me, inspiring, you know, it was inspiring just to see how someone could manage an intellectual property that started in comic book form, mm -hmm. you know, to get as large as that. But getting back to me drawing it, um, yeah, it was just, it was just really fun and challenging. And Andy would, you know, we, we had such a shorthand where, you know, Andy's scripts are deceptively simple. I mean, they're not, I mean, they're, they're lean, but I think it's because he would trust that he could tell me, okay, Sean, you're going to have a scene with, you know, this character, you know, uh, engaging in a rooftop chase in Venice. And he doesn't have to get super detailed because I, he knows that I'm going to add it. And that was just really fun to work with him. And then ultimately Brett Lewis came in and wrote the final arc of Thief of Thieves. And then we wrapped it up. And I think it was what, 40, 
42, 44 issues, you know, mm. which is, you know, the that's the longest I've ever been on a title. And, you know, to, to say that I have like 40 something issues of, uh, of, a, of a block of work is, is pretty cool. I have a question for all three of you, because I'm like the indie cat in the room, I guess. Um, how does it feel to be on a long arc of something and then start to like once is there a like a meaty center of a project that goes on for 20 plus issues like like towards the middle? Are you just kind of like, OK, well, I'm living in this. You have a really good uh, shorthand of the characters and what's going to happen next and then starting to slow down and know it's wrapping. Like, you know, can any of you guys talk about how the flow of the relationship of collaboration changes over this, the timeline of a, a long project like that? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Any of you guys want to answer that? Uh, <laughs> In my case, on what I did, when I ran, ran with things for a very long time, it usually wasn't my choice to end it. So it wasn't as if I was, yeah. you know, part of a wind down process. It was some editorial shift or something else happened. Um, so, but I think working with collaborators, if you really are on a great wavelength with them, it's like a, a kind of a family situation almost. You know, you get so comfortable with the way the other person thinks that it's. Um, I don't know. It's kind of, It's like a. I. It's like a dance back and forth where what they do is going to inspire you, and the longer you work together they know what you're going to give them in a sense. So they will ask for something that will inspire them when they see what you do with it. So it's just back and forth and you get into a nice rhythm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to say that I, I am a big Brett Blevins fan and, and because, and, and it's interesting because I think, and I, it's been so long, so I really can't remember the exact continuity, but I remember that I remember Brett's work on new mutants and cloak and dagger but he would be following people who had been on there for a while. And so I, and maybe I might have this wrong, Brett, but it's, it's like, for some reason, I remember your style being really different from who you were following. Yeah. It, it, was that the case? Because I, and I just remember like when I first like would see your art, I'm like, wait, this is completely different. But then I would get into it and then I would really be kind of, I would I'd be like, okay, wow. Okay. I get it. And I'm hooked on this style. Did you, did, am I remembering that right with New Mutants and Cloak and Dagger? Oh, yeah, I think so. But I, I one of the things that uh, about those times that I think uh, modern fans and, and creators as well working in the new environment, it was much less, um, you know, we in those days, there was no knowledge that they were ever even going to be reprinted. Mm. It wasn't like we were working towards collecting them every six issues or for all we knew, this would be it, and it'd never be seen again after those 30 days on the stands. It, it right. just wasn't happening very much back then. So there was not a pressure to to, uh, to create a continuity with whoever had been doing the book before. I mean, especially at Marvel, the atmosphere was so freewheeling with that. The idea was, let's do something different. Let's just have fun. You know, Everybody was encouraged to do their own take on everything. Um, even for a fill-in, it wasn't like you were trying to maintain a consistent-looking worldview and that um, was before they also had all the editorial meetings when they would say okay for the next five years here's all these little pieces and these are the pieces you get and these other people get these pieces that was mm -hmm. before i mean i think the secret wars was the first time where they went across all the books with like mm -hmm. you had you had your issue with the beyonder and all that so it was it brett's right it was very it was very different um and it's also different because I've done long things like on Darkhawk, but I also did long things where I inked like Shazam. I did 27 issues. I think Alpha Flight did 27 issues. So it's oh, also wow. different if you ink something. Mm -hmm. And nobody does that now. Nobody does like besides what, Eric Larson? <laughs> no, mm -hmm. hardly anybody. Do, or maybe like if you're doing a creator-owned book at Image, <laughs> right? But at the majors, nobody does 27 yeah. issues of something straight. They actually don't even want you to do mm -hmm. 27 issues of something straight, which is actually the opposite of how it was. They wanted to find people who could produce the same material every month. Mm -hmm. yeah. And after Image, especially by the mid, the late 90s, my last monthly book was Shazam, Power of Shazam. 
And I did 27 okay. issues of that. And the last issue, I, I did the, the, the last issue. And then after that, I started doing storyboards. So okay. nobody did. I think Pete Krause stayed on it. The penciler stayed on it. But they never had anybody on Darkhawk as long as me after it seemed like that was sort of like the end of people doing long, long runs. And th right. that's in, you know, in the in the mainstream. But I'm sure if you're doing, you know, like Jeff Smith doing all of his bone or you're doing all of your thing with, with Kirkman. So it's it's like a different mindset, too, because I don't think people were thinking about it in that way. Not, but, not but Mike, so, 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 Mike, when you were doing Dark Art, that was Dark, Dark, uh, dark um, just, I'm just blank, I'm just blank out, but that was the 90s. Was that the 90s? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We're starting, yeah, 90. Because, see, because that's like when I kind of started falling out of continuity. I think I stopped reading comics regularly, like right around Image. When Image sort of debuted, then I just kind of. I kind of like read like the first wave of image and then I started like sort of focusing on other things. And, and so, yeah. So like I, so when I see yeah, a dark arc, so when, so when I, when I looked you up, I was like, okay, I'm familiar with your style. I'm familiar with your art, but those books I didn't read. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's, it's funny how at that point there are people that I get now who have gray hair on their chin who are <laughs> reading that stuff as kids now. Wow. And they come up, and I get letters from people to, oh, you know, that was my first series. That was like their Spider-Man number one, because yeah. Marvel was doing that. They were starting twelve new books, I think, a year. Mm -hmm. So everybody got a number one. Everybody could follow along. You didn't have to go yeah. buy the old issues, and that seemed to really work to, for them. But then when the image thing came along, the reason people bought in red comics became different because. When I yeah. came in, and same with Brett, people weren't buying them to collect to think that they would be worth money. Yeah. They were buying them to collect because they liked reading comic books. So there mm -hmm. wasn't another agenda that, oh, yeah, now I'm going to put this in my trailer, and in five years, huh, QVC, <laughs> you wait and see. I got all those <laughs> certificates of authenticity. You know, that whole yeah. thing really changed stuff quite a bit, so... Wow. We were talking on the previous podcast. I mean, you there used to be a real definition between mainstream, underground, like Robert Crumb, right? Mm -hmm. And then that middle indie ground, which might be like Love and Rockets and things like that. So mm -hmm. those guys did their own stuff. But in the main and then the mainstream, that was sort of like when I got in, that was the goal to get to get a regular book. Now it's kind of like you hop, you know, you do four issues of here, hop, do four issues of there, hop, you know, or hop in. Like you could go back to DC, hop in, do Batman for six issues, get a buzz, hop out, go do your own. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Which it seems like that's sort of the model that a lot of people are doing now. And then when yeah. you go out and you get a little buzz in the indie thing, then the majors go, oh, here's a hot. Indie guy, I, you know, gal. I want them to mm hop -hmm. on the book. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, exactly. I think for me, I don't think there was ever because going back to Jamar's original question about whether or not there was ever like an ebb or like a, a peak. Um, I guess the way I would approach Thief of Thieves is kind of like the way I approach anything is that telling the story is like the challenge so if i'm on issue 10 okay i got through issue 10 so if i so now i got to figure out what i'm gonna how i'm gonna get through issue 11 and then you just kind of keep doing that so by the time when i when i was like maybe down to like the last two issues of thief of thieves i was like oh shit, i'm almost done with this mm -hmm. you know i'm almost done and then it's weird because you know you Fortunately, like, you know, you have things lined up, so you kind of go from one project to another. And so, like, as soon as I was done with Thief of Thieves, I think um, I think I, I went right into Promete. I, I just jumped on that. And, you know, it was just uh, – and so I really didn't have a chance. Like, I think I had a brief little, wow, I'm kind of done, and that, 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 that project is done, and, you know, working with Skybound in, in that capacity is done. But then I just jumped to something new. And then it started all over again. I'm like, okay, now you have to sort of figure out how to get through page one, page two, page three, and then you start on another project. So yeah, I never really had like a point where I was kind of like, 
all right, this is like a high point. Like for me, like I'm on, I'm I'm my own worst critic. Like I, uh, whenever I look at something, I'm like, oh god damn it, which is a lot of times why I have stuff on the wall because, mm. as you can see, I still draw it by hand, uh, and so whenever I finish a page of artwork, you know, I'll scan into Photoshop, do a couple of tweaks, and then send off the digital file. But then I'll put it on the wall so I can kind of see it um, to keep track of continuity, but also to sort of see mistakes. And a lot of times I'll take a page off the wall because I've been looking at like panel three, which has like an elbow that's, uh, that's like wrong for like a, a week. And then I'll go back, take it off, fix it, do a patch or whatever, rescan it and be like, hey guys, I just replaced the file on the FTP. And that's pretty much like my process in terms of like just, you know, you know, uh, keep an eye on continuity. Is that something you learned from a, at school or did you pick it up from somebody else? Or is that something you developed yourself? Um, I mean, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. I don't think it was school, although, because I went to School of Visual Arts for college, and what you would do is they give you an assignment, and next time you, you come in, you would put your stuff on the wall, right. and then they would evaluate it. I mean, maybe subconsciously that's what I did, but I think, I think it's when I got wall space. <laughs> <laughs> when I actually have wall space and I can say, okay, cool. Cause even this wall is like not quite big enough because I can only fit about, what is that? Like three, six, nine, 12. And then I have to sort of reset. So if I can have a whole wall, that'd be great. But I think that's just, I just, um, just started tacking up my work because a lot of times when, when you work, when I'm working, um, by hand, you get that distortion when you're working at an angle. Mm. And then sometimes yeah. when you look at the work dead on, you're like, oh, wow, okay, there was a little bit of a distortion there. So it's all, I, I find it to be best to look at it on, on the wall. So, yeah, I think that's just organically. No, yeah, I, th I think there's something really important about being able to put everything up in front of you. I kind of I call that, Sean, zooming out, right? Hmm. So like, kind of like in Photoshop, Photoshop. With, you're hitting the thing. It's just so you can see things in an overview. Yeah. Well, that, that's one of the reasons why, like, I don't think I could. I mean, I think I'm too old to sort of learn the new tricks of drawing in, in drawing digitally. But when people have, when I've seen fellow artists do that, they're like, hey, listen, you can zoom in, get really, really detailed and zoom out and zoom in. And that sounds like, like I could get lost in that whole thing. Like, you know, just zooming in and out with detail. You know, because I think the way the way a lot of times I work and the way I think my style is kind of developed is that there's a little bit of a impressionist kind of approach because sometimes I know that this is going to get shot down, and so I can work a little looser knowing that it's going to be shot down at least like fifty percent, and so things will tighten. Mm -hmm. So, God forbid, doing it digitally and zooming in, zooming out. You know, although I have seen people work people who work digital, they get some of the sharpest lines that I'm so jealous of. I'm like, how the hell did you get that line so thin, man? Damn. So. Well, you're, that's the danger of working digitally is that one thing about working on paper is you always see the whole page at once, which is really important in comics. Yep. But when you get lost in the drawing, because I've done all kinds of stuff in all different ways and combinations and ways. Sometimes that thin line thing, for me, in any way, is not intentional because I'm inking a panel sized image that's 18 inches across for, because of some complexity in the shot. And when I take it down, it looks like little fairy dust lines, you know, it's so thin. <laughs> right over it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I learned, I learned because I do the two strips, one all traditional, the Phantom, and then I do Judge Parker all digital. And so it took a while to get. Judge Parker to where I want it. You have the learning curve of the digital and everything. And you're right. You don't see the image all at one time, which you're always aware of when you're working traditionally. You're always like, oh, it's easy to even like you're drawing the same person. Oh, the nose is too long to this long, right? You can just do that and see. Where digital, you're like sliding it, going in, going out. So what I found out is that there's a certain pencil size. I never ink anything smaller than that, like, 10 point or whatever because once it's reduced it'll mm. be too small it'll be too brittle right it'll be mm. it'll just be too brittle and that is you know and then i still do this thing where i from when i had my wacom before i ever had my cintiq i would have to look at the screen when i was drawing and it's mm. the drawing isn't here right 
And so I've trained myself, even though I use the Cintiq, a lot of times I'm still looking at the screen, not at the at the, the monitor, I should say, rather than at the at the screen. Wow. So I go back and forth. Um, Maybe a doctor could help with that. <laughs> <laughs> I go back and forth. Like today, I just finished Judge Parker. So for the last two days, I've been working all digitally. And now I'm jumping back and working traditionally. Um, and the reason I did the digital thing is, one, I wanted to learn how to use it. Mm. And number two, I've got a – literally, I have a stack that thick of Judge Parker. Wow. Yep. So at a certain point, like I can sell the Phantom pages, but there's not a big demand for the Judge Parker stuff. And I, you know, I love the craft, but I figured, you know, at a certain point, I, I've got to try to be uh, realistic about that. If I was do, I would always prefer, like you, to have lettering on the board, right? Mm -hmm. Do it. I'm totally old school, as Al Williamson used to say, work for the original. That was his whole thing. He liked yeah. having a nice original. And when you look at his originals, there is a beauty to them that you do not see in the reproduction. Sure. Right. Right. Sure. And that and those guys from the old school had that. You know, you don't really, you know, when you're working digitally, you're working because Walt Disney wants you to give them a digital file. They do not uh -huh. want you to give them a piece of paper. They don't want paper. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the challenge is to always have a feed in both worlds because then that way you don't lose the feel for the, the traditional stuff. You know? Yeah, I, I definitely think that, um, but it's interesting what you were talking about with the zooming in and not being able to see the full page, because sometimes I guess I do experience that if I work at a sequence. And so like if I have five panels on a page and I decide to start with panel five, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to put a piece of paper over that so I don't sort of put my hand on mm, that when I, okay. when I go up. And so when, I, when I'm done with panel two, and then I'll, I'll say, okay, let me see how that looks compared to panel five. Then it's, I guess I'm in that same boat of zooming in, zooming out. And then I see the whole thing again, you know, but, but then going to your point about the originals. Yeah. Like I have like all my originals. So <laughs> I just have like stacks and stacks of, of, of uh, paper and, but you know what, they don't, you know, lettering isn't done on the board anymore. That's all digital too. So um, when you see my, you know, the artwork behind me, that's just all art and, and the digital files are, uh, the the lettering files are separate. Those are all digital. Yeah, I I miss the lettering on the on the board. Um, Walt, Simon, you know. Walt Simonson is having um, John Workman do the lettering on the board for Ragnarok. What really? He's doing that old school like that? Writing it right on the board by hand. So oh, Walt loves having the whole page look like a comic book. He doesn't like the lettering missing. So mm -hmm. yeah, he and John still work the, the same way they always do. I tell you, like I, I have those artist editions, and I, 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 I damn, I curse Scott Dunbier's, you know, name all the time because he got me hooked on buying those things, and, you know, I would just, I remember when I got the Walt Simonson one, I was just looking through it like, like a tome, like I was just looking because you can see all of like the the whiteout and the, you know, like the the erasers and like the actual like you know ink that's kind of like you know rubbed out or whatever, and it was just so. I was just, just like, oh my God, this is so awesome. And and um, then then when they released the Bill Sienkiewicz one, I was just like, I was waiting on pins and needles for that one to be released. And I ordered that as soon as it dropped. And when that came in the mail, I was just looking at just, just you know, the, just the pages and how they looked. And I'm like, wow, and those are so good. And I, I would totally recommend aspiring artists or aspiring comic book artists, you know, to look at those things because they're so yeah. informative. You know yeah. what I mean? Anybody who's, a, especially if you're like an aspiring comic book artist, to pick up one of those artist editions and, all right, maybe you can go to the library or, or at least shell out for at least one of them. But just to see how the artists, how the how the lines look, the brushwork looks, it's 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 so, oh, yeah. it's, it's, like, it's, like a, it's like an art class. And but, cheaper than a year at SVA. When, <laughs> when I see seen when, I saw, when those started coming out and I was seeing them, I was just thinking, I would have killed to have had had something like this in the seventies when I was trying to learn how to do this, and now yeah. all this wonderful original artwork is available, and most people work digitally. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It's 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 funny, like kind of jumping back, like I you know one of I was introduced to uh, I was first introduced to comic professionals um, when I was taking a, a cartooning class, and it was taught by Michael Davis. 
And Michael Davis knew, so you know, he would bring, he was introduce his class to his friends that he knew in the industry. And that's where I first met uh, Walt Simonson, Walt and Luis, um, really sweet people. And Walt would show us all of his art, his original artwork. And I'm like, oh, wow. And I still have like a, an apocalypse sketch that he had given me from the 80s. Mm-hmm. And it's just, and to see his work, you know, up close was just really awesome. And, and, and so it was fortunate that I got that experience back then, but now as an adult and as like a professional to sort of, you know, go back and, and, and look at how other people, you know, draw in their process. You know, for me, like I never stopped being a fan, you know, yeah. cause it's all about getting better. And, and so like, I always like look at other people's work and say, okay, that's a really interesting way they solve that problem, you know, or damn, that's a great brush stroke. Like, you know, how do they get the, the ink to break like that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and, and so I'll, I'll interview like, you know, prof- you know, whenever I meet industry professionals, it's like, I, I do like a Barbara Walters 60 minutes on him. I ask them like a zillion and one questions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that time I spent in uh, Al Williamson's studio with his amazing collection was probably the year I, I advanced the most as an artist because you could see the originals. And you could see, oh, here's a, an original by Salinas, the guy, just a Cisco kid who drew these beautiful animals and horses, yeah. and all, all with a brush, like Russ Heath, just all with a brush. And then he had Al stuff, and he had, you know, Raymond and Foster. And I had never seen the, the originals by uh, by those. And then to see it all and to be able to study it, yeah. it was that's, I think, that's like how the old guys learn because they learn being an assistant or an apprentice. Mm-hmm. And they saw, oh, this is how you do this line. This is a brush. This is a pen. There's a lot you can't tell. And, you know, digital, it's all the same. It says it's a brush or a pen, but, yeah, you know. You know, before before everything got shut down, like I would, one of the things I would do is go to the museum and, you know, just sort of look at, at, at works of art and just really look closely at the brush strokes and the techniques of the different pieces. And I would always tell aspiring artists to, like, go to a museum. It's, it's cheap. And just really just look at the different approaches and styles of of art and images, you know what I mean? Because it's just it's a constant learning lesson. Oh yeah, I don't think you ever you ever stop. I mean, Al never stopped learning. He was like the world's biggest comic book and comic art fan when I, when I met him. He was like a little younger than I am now, which is funny when I think about it. He was like. <laughs> 53, 54, so he's actually a couple of years younger than I am now. But it's he was a huge, huge fan. Huh? It's not not not. <laughs> but he was a huge fan yeah. all his life. And he was almost like when he would draw, he was like a almost like a little kid with his tongue stuck out. Yeah. Having fun. And that's like that's what you want to be, even at this stage, you want to be like the little kid with your tongue stuck out drawing, you know? And yeah, I mean, and, and, I, and I think that, you know, yeah, you want to pay your bills because, you know, uh, trading <laughs> trading goods for goods and services for money is how we live in this world. But, you know, for me, like, I, I think that sometimes it's all about solving the problem and figuring out how to sort of translate what's in your head to what's on the paper. That's the eternal struggle, to get exactly you know, how I saw it down. And sometimes when I nail it, I'm like, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. You know, and then, and then that's, that's when you have the tongue in your mouth and you're like, oh yes, I got it. Everything else, nothing else matters. You know, it's just sort of getting that, that gesture right or that angle right or that scene right. You know, and that's, that's, that's sort of the thrill of being an artist. And, you know, it's, a, it's a really special, it's a special thing to create like that. Was, was there a, was there an artist or a mentor or somebody who was pivotal in your process and your development of that trajectory? Um, you know, I always cite my two mentors as being Gil Ashby and Michael Davis. And I met them when uh, when I was in high school. I went to Music and Art High School, which is the fame school in, in Manhattan. And um, a buddy of mine uh, was, was a, uh, an art major. And he was like, Hey, I, I, I'm going, I take this cartooning class up in Harlem on the weekends. Cause I, I lived in New York at the time. And um, I said, okay, cool. And it was free. And I, I went with him and, and 
it was called the Children's Art Carnival. It was a nonprofit um, thing where they would have you know, black professionals come in and teach classes, and it was for free. And uh, that's where I met Gil Ashby, who taught illustration, and Michael Davis, who taught a cartooning class. And I always tell this story. Um, so if you've heard it before, forgive me. But um, Gil was the purist in terms of like the artist. He was like, you have to learn how to draw. You have to learn perspective, anatomy, you know, all this stuff. And Davis was like, this is a business. This is a business. You got to hustle. You got to hustle. You got to hustle. And that's something that art schools never teach you. They never teach you about the business aspect of being an artist. And so that really gave me a great edge when it came to sort of looking at art as a business. And so having that, that those two opposing, or not opposing, but those two different ways approaching art, that probably really shaped me the most. And then, like I said, once I started, you know, when I was a comic fan, so I was reading comics, but then as a part of Davis's class, I would meet the artists whose work I was reading. So I'm like, wait, that's Walt Simonson. Okay, I, I read his Thor stuff. And, you know, and, and his wife, Louise, she writes X Factor, and I'm, I'm meeting them in person. And to be able to meet people whose work, you know, you only see names, yep. you know what I mean? Yeah. So when you meet them in person, it's like this whole other thing. And then he introduced, you know, introduced, I, I met Bill Sienkiewicz and Dennis Cowan and, you know, so many different artists, but these are people whose work that I followed anyway. And so I just kept sort of, <coughs> and, you know, back in high school, I would just buy a whole bunch of comics, you know, because Marvel would put out a whole bunch and I would buy every monthly book. And they had so many different styles that I, I liked, but I started gravitating more towards like a Frank Miller, David Mazzucchelli, Mike Mignola, people that really use a lot of sort of like shadow, you know, shadow and light, heavy contrast work. And I think that's really where I started to go. But then I was a huge Bill Sienkiewicz fan and Bill was bringing in a whole sort of uh, commercial illustration approach to comics. Mm -hmm. yeah. And once again, Davis had introduced his class to the Society of Illustrators. And so at the time, the Society of Illustrators, they, they, it was this, this um, organization where, you know, they had artists that were men, that were members and they would put out these annuals that they would collect, you know, all of the artists for that year and they would put out these annuals and, you know, they were like 50 bucks and back when I was in high school, college, I would go to the Strand, for those of you in New York, where you go to the Strand, you get a lot of cheap used books and I would, and I would buy the used versions of the Society of Illustrators mm -hmm. books. And then that's when I would sort of discover people like Bart Forbes and Bernie Fuchs and, and really mainstream illustrators. So I was really being inspired by comics as well as mainstream commercial illustrators. And that kind of helped shape me in terms of like how I started developing my style, you know, and then that's, that sort of, that sort of moved from high school to um, when I went to school of visual arts and I majored in illustration. And then that led to me ultimately getting my first professional work when I was a junior at SVA and I got my first professional work for Marvel Comics as an illustrator. So I was painting, like fully painted comics at that time. What year was that? 1992. I will not forget that. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yeah, Marvel, Marvel, they they had the the uh, Hellraiser license. Oh yeah. And, and the editor in charge of that was Marcus McLaurin. Yep. And, and I remember at the time, you know, because that back then the New York Comic Con was the only game in town. So if you wanted to sort of break into comics, you went to the New York Comic Con and you waited online with your portfolio and you would show it to people. And I did that and I showed my portfolio to Marcus McLaurin. And, you know, he was like, OK, this is good. Here's my card. Give me a call. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and then I, you know, I, I went into the Marvel offices, met with him and he was like, OK, well, you know, I'm 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 one of the things I'm, I'm editing is the Clive Barker Hellraiser line. And he uh, gave my first job was like a, a pinup, which is a full page illustration uh, for Hellraiser. And it was, so I painted it. It was like a mix of like watercolor airbrush and all that stuff. And he gave me like another one that I did a short story at the time. Alex Ross was doing a short story for Hellraiser and then he did Marvel's and then Marvel's blew up and then, and then, Marvel said, hey, listen, let's put out more painted books like that. And um, I did like the third book that came out and it was called Tales of the Marvels Blockbuster. And it was written by, I believe that was Mike Barron. 
I think Mike Barron wrote that, you know. And so then I, so I really got my start in comics just doing fully painted work, like, you know, in the, in the Bill Sienkiewicz, Alex Ross thing. And then once those books tanked, because, you know, we weren't Alex Ross, <laughs> you know, they were like, okay, that, that, that costs a lot. We're, you know, paying people that high page rate for full, fully illustrated pages. Yeah, we're going to cut that out. Um, but at the time, I knew the Milestone guys because they had set up shop across town because at the time Marvel's offices were on Park Avenue. This is all in this is all taking place in New York for you out of towners. But um three, three, Marvel, 387 Park Avenue. Yep. Yep. You know, you know, Brett knows. So yeah, so I would literally like leave Marvel. Well actually I was still in college, so in between classes I'd go to Marvel, drop off work, and then I go hang out at the Milestone offices which were on twenty third street. Uh and I would just walk over there, kind of hang out with them. And they were like, hey, listen, um, would you want to ink static? And I was like, sure, what the hell? Mm-hmm. You know, that, that sounds like fun. And, and it was a new guy named John Paul Leon that they were that they were breaking in on the title. Um, and the, the original inker, Steve Mitchell, I think left after issue four. And they were like, hey, would you want to work with John? I was like, yeah, this guy's stuff is great. And I worked with John for years as his inker. And then that really got me into sort of like a black and white kind of thinking. And then that led to me. And then I said, okay, listen, let me start getting back into penciling. And, and then I uh, did like a Batman one shot. And then I got offered Detective Comics. And then that really sort of started me on the path of sort of just drawing in black and white. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I wanted to show the cover of your book okay and thought maybe we could talk about that quickly sure all right uh so sean what are we looking at okay so on the 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 left hand side you have how to draw into our comics which is my uh art uh, instruction book Mm -hmm. at the time the image on the on the on the right is sort of like a gang page of various projects I've worked on. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the book project? Because I, I know a lot of uh, people have your book on their shelf. Uh, that uh, that's that's really humbling to hear, and it's it's awesome. Yeah, the book came out of um, you know there are a couple of ways. I think one of the things I learned as a freelancer in this industry is that being a freelancer can be a little tenuous in terms of like jobs, you know, Mm -hmm. because you, you might be really cool with an editor and that editor will give you work and then something will happen. Either that editor will get fired or they'll leave. And then you've kind of lost your rabbi and you're like, Mm -hmm. and then the new editor has their people they want to work with. And then you're kind of ass out. Yeah. And so that had happened to me a couple of times. I said, you know what? I kind of, I need to sort of figure out a way to kind of reinvent myself and also expand my, my reach beyond comics. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a friend, Joe Illich was working uh, at Watson Guptill and they were putting out art instruction books and just casually, he was like, Hey, you ought to put an art book. And I was like, that's a good idea. I sounded like Joe. Joe. (laughs) I was like, you know what? That's a good idea. I will do that. So I put together a pitch, pitched them, and they, they, they dug it, and I did the art book. But the way I approached the art book was sort of less instructional, and it was more bringing people into the way I tell stories and the way I view storytelling. And I thought that that might be a little more interesting to, to do. And what you're looking at now is that I try to think outside the box with regard to promoting it, and so I shot like a mini trailer for the book. And uh, that was really fun. Like I just shot it at a buddy's house in New York and we just ran all over the city with no permits and just <laughs> videotape things in different locations. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. So were you a fan of, of uh, film noir in general? Yeah. I mean, or I film, think. Or film, classic Hollywood film? Uh, now, I'm not sure if I would say the classics. I mean, you know, Citizen Kane's great, Psycho's great and, and that. But what I did was I, I did gravitate towards films that had like a noir kind of sensibility. And one of the people I always reference this is that um, one of my biggest influences was the director, Tony Scott. Mm-hmm. And 
I really studied Tony Scott's films in terms of like how they were composed because he and his brother Ridley Scott, they came from commercials. And so they had this whole commercial aesthetic with how they shot their films. And, um, and you could trace this back actually to, you can credit this to Jerry, to Simpson and Bruckheimer, the producers, the, the, the big action blockbuster producers of the eighties. And what they did, which was really novel is that they reached out to advertising and commercial directors to direct movies. So you had a bunch of people like Tony Scott, Adrian Lyne, um, a few other directors that really had a very dramatic look to their films. And that's the kind of stuff that really impacted me and influenced me with regard to sort of composing images, uh, even for this like trailer. So you were trying to be, uh, you were trying to, to uh, be uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the slick Hollywood sort of, because uh, I always think of Ridley Scott as being slick. Uh, Tony Scott was slicker, I think, more commercial than Ridley mm. Scott. I think Ridley mm. Scott's a little bit more subdued in, in some in some ways, but because you could always tell yeah. a, a Tony Scott film just within the first what, thirty seconds, you could sort I mean, of. It, it, they're so distinct. I think you know, it's interesting because they both approach film very similar, but Tony's more Tony was more prolific. Like he just has just done more films. Um, uh, but if you look at his films, like for me, like I always I always tell people, look at the opening of Top Gun. The opening sequence of Top Gun is amazing. Now, of course, you have the whole Harold Faltermeyer score and the Highway to the Danger Zone song. But if you look at the way that 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 film opens and it's shot, you know, sort of like at a magic hour, the sun is behind everything. You know, it's just it's just really like such like that's that's quintessential Tony Scott. And so for me, like, yeah, you can call them slick. But I think it's they were just really playing with light with light and shadow far more than your average person was, you know? And to me, like they just influenced, like that whole commercial look really influenced television and film because once producer Jerry Bruckheimer did CSI, CSI didn't look like anything else that was on television. And it right. looked like those slick movies. And now if you look at a comedy, a comedy looks like a Tony Scott film, as opposed to a comedy that was shot in like the eighties, the nineties, or even the early part of the millennium. Right, yeah, I, and I also think that uh, Ridley Scott um, was very, in, very uh, much like Cuba was really into sound. His yeah. films really have a lot of sound. The, the sound is is just as important in his films. Yeah, sound design, his his musical score. You know the editing. Yeah. You know the editing is just really just like the shots are just amazing. And I just would really study how his 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 his. Um, shots were framed. And that really had like a very direct, you know, influence on me and how I tell stories, you know? So a lot of times people say, Hey, you, your work has a very cinematic quality to it. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad it shows. Cause that's really what, what influences me. Have you, ever, have you ever done storyboards? You know, I've done storyboards uh, here and there, but not steady. You know, like I, like a, I, I'm rep by an agent that's, that, that would get me commercial storyboarding work. So I've done it here and there, but you know, and, and she'll call like out of the blue and say, Hey, can we get like a spot done for something like, and we need to buy in like 30 minutes. So I'm like, wait, what? what? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. what? You know Friday, but, it's Friday night, you got to work all weekend. We need it Monday morning. Yeah. It's like, does it really have to have that kind of a turnaround time guys? Really? Really? But yeah, but I have done storyboards and storyboards are fun. They're actually really fun. For, for me to do it, it. You have to kind of switch your brain in terms of like just sort of doing something really, really quick versus like a page, but it's right. the same kind of thought process. It's the, the challenge is sort of telling the story. Yeah. Were you, uh, I mean, when I first started doing it, I really fell in love with it, but it's a different kind of discipline because you have real time to work with, as opposed to depending on the reader to follow your panels, you know, and you're stuck in that one size frame. So everything exciting has to happen within the same layout. Um, yeah. I really, but it's I don't. Funny. No, it's funny that you ask because actually, like, I've just I totally blanked out. I actually am working on a storyboard gig now, like, a, like for like a, it's like a, an upcoming Netflix documentary, and they had reached out to me and they said, "Hey, we have like a one minute scene, like two one minute sequences that we we really would love you to do." So 
you know, so yeah, so I kind of did them and now I'm kind of like in the revising stage where they're like, oh, how about this panel? Yeah. <laughs> can, we, can we swap that panel for this panel? And I'm like, okay, that, that was, that's, here we go with the advertising fun with the whole, can we change this and swap that? It's not a big deal kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I remember um, when I started boarding, one of the things I did uh, was I read shot by shot but I also would uh, record movies off of uh, Turner Classic Movies that I liked, and I would do reverse storyboarding, what I call, where I would actually storyboard, I would go through a scene and storyboard mm -hmm. the whole thing out just to sort of see how it all Interesting. worked. Um, Interesting. And um, that's a really good way to actually pull the film apart, hmm. and study the uh, composition, the eye, the eye flow, like at the top of the screen, you know, most of the eyes are like at the top of the screen, right? Most of the, yeah. uh, are, but that's something that I actually didn't learn, even from that book. It's something I learned from studying film hmm. that I became aware of. Because if you have one scene where the person's eyes are here, and then the next scene where the person's eyes are here, you're doing mm -hmm. this when you're watching, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So it's like yep. you're watching a like a, a ping pong game <laughs> or something, right? Um, so when I, I, I learned a lot by studying, uh, films that I liked, which is, you know, the great Hollywood stuff because the craft was so high. And even the first year of shows like Gunsmoke, mm -hmm. I would show those to my class because since the TV is small, like the size of our computer screens, Mm -hmm. They brought those guys from Hollywood over to film that stuff, and it read great on a small little TV screen. You could see everything just like that. So all mm -hmm. the lighting and all that stuff. So you, you learned, like, none of that was by accident. The time of day they shot was on purpose, mm -hmm. so you would see the shadows underneath the chin and everything. You know, they did all that stuff. And uh, it's always funny to, to teach stuff like that because then people go, oh, I just thought, you know, you just made a film, you know. It just, it just, it just happened. You know, you know. You get the lightsaber. You stand over there, and you get the other lightsaber, and you know, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think back, like in the early part of the millennium, I actually was shooting some short films that I was directing and working with with actors, and that was some of the most fun I've ever had because number one, I didn't have to draw everything out. <laughs> so I can I could do a storyboard and and I you know I could there could be a scene in Grand Central Station I'm like okay I don't have to draw this, <laughs> but working with actors and 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 I always thought this was like a, such a cliche I really because you know you see that in TV shows and movies all the time but it really freaking is helpful <laughs> you know <laughs> so, so like I would do, so I would be like wow okay like I got it and I think that having the background of telling stories through comics you you know in the comic book medium really gave me an edge when it came to shooting and directing because I knew the shots. I knew, okay, I need a close-up. I need a medium. And I'm very aware of how things are, are sort of framed. And and that's exactly like what I, I use when I draw, you know, comic, what I draw, you know, now. And it's, it, it makes me think about when people are like, oh, well, do you think that movie theaters might go the way of the, you know, the dinosaur and, you know, why go to like a big screen where you, why to go to a movie theater where you can watch on a big screen in your house? So I'm like, let me tell you something. Unless you have a 50 foot screen in your house, there is nothing that will give you the same kind of effect as sitting in a theater and seeing like, you know, an actor, like, you know, like looking up at that actor doing something, you're never going to get the same effect at home with your big screen TV. Yeah. You know, yeah. you just you just can't, you know, and so. Yeah. Um, I you know what, Sean, I had a question about your your eye for uh, spotting blacks and the whole noir thing that you're so known for. Did you mm -hmm. draw any of your kind of uh, education from comics? Like, were you in the Toth, or did you study any anybody else who did a lot of heavy blacks, like Miller, at some point, or did you just? bring it all from cinema? Um, it was definitely a mixture of both. Toth, Toth was, I really, you know, started looking at Toth. Um, you know, Mazzucchelli, Miller, a lot of, there were then, then there were like the European artists. Um, now I'm going to blank out on their names, but I would say, okay, like I really like, well, Mobius, but Mobius was more linear. Like he didn't really do the, the shadows. You mean like Munoz, but, like Munoz? Munoz and some the guy that did uh, oh yeah, like, yeah 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 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that kind of stuff like that, you know, e- even today, like uh, like I, when I was I was in Angoulême about a year or two back and I was just walking through, you know, the, the bookstores there just like really saying, oh, okay, let me kind of see like who, like what new artists can I sort of get hip to just learning about, you know, here. And I'm like, oh, I've never heard of that guy, but I love that style. And so like I had all these, I mean, I had to use discipline because I mean, I, I, I couldn't bring all this stuff in my suitcase. Because I was like, all right, crap! I got. How am I going to schlep this back to the plane? And right. I need that. another plane. I need another suitcase and, and five suitcases. Yeah, and another so, plane. So I had to be very disciplined, but I bought a couple of books. But I'm always sort of looking for like you know artists that have that kind of that kind of eye with the shadows, you know. So it's always a mixture of film and art. Was it? Were you into Hugo Pratt and Michaluzzi yep. and guys like that? Yep. Because it's funny because Toth was is sort of a guy that leads you back through all these other people that were not only influenced by him but were also influenced by Kniff mm-hmm. and yep. Sickles and, and Frank Robbins and and stuff. Yeah. And it's funny to see how they ran with that much longer in Europe than we did in America. Yeah, yeah. We I, I think I think have you seen this? Whoa, wait, what is that? Who is that? Brecha. Brecha. Oh. No, if they just finally it took them forever to get this together and reprint it, but it's fantastic. Oh wow! No, no, no. Okay, what, can I can I can I get that on, can I get that on Amazon or will I have to go yeah. to Stewart? No, I, well, probably either 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 yeah. or. Yeah, you get that from you get that from Brett's house. It's from, <laughs> it's from, the, it's from the early sixties. Yeah. Oh, nice, 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 nice. But yeah, nice. It's gorgeous. So, so Brett, what's that address? Where, where, and when are you not home? <laughs> <laughs> this just nice. came out. What what came out last year, right? Yeah, it's pretty new. Yeah, because yeah, I got okay. mine last year too. Wow. Okay, right, I'm gonna. I will investigate. I don't know. There's a. That's the. This is the English version, printed by. Oh, it's Fanographics. So you'll be able to get it easily. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. And it's got a lot of stuff in it. It's thick. Oh man. Sean, aren't you glad you came on the show? Yeah, listen. I mean, this is all, it's always great hanging out with other artists, you know, like picking people's brain. I, I I love it. So I really appreciate the invitation, guys. Oh, so yeah. so so what? When did you become aware of Toth? Was it when you were a kid, or when you were in college? Or were you? you know, I think for some reason, like John Paul Leon was really into Toth. He was really into Toth. But I remember having a Toth book before I met John. Like I had those those Hanna Barbera designs Mm -hmm. you know so i think i think i think that's just something we just had in common we both like that and so you know he would be like oh did you get this book or do you have this book and i'd be like oh do you have that and so yeah i think that was it but yeah toth is just uh, it's just really yeah it's just i have a bunch of his books a bunch matt waringo just put the amazon link for that yeah, it's funny because um, I got to know a lot of guys from Argentina, like uh, Ricardo Villagran and people like that, and they all had guys. And there's all these guys in South America, just like in Europe, they were all really influenced by Kniff. And so you saw mm-hmm. all the like Alfonso Font and all these other guys are, and they're probably mid '60s or '70s now. They were like you know uh, uh, Hugo Pratt were totally into that whole thin line with a just a big fat black, not a lot of rendering. They weren't, they weren't the Raymond guys, you know, they're yeah. not like, like Salinas was like the Raymond Foster guy. Right. But mm-hmm. it's, it's funny to, to see, or um, the guy who does uh, Dieter Lumpen um, uh, and he's doing, um, he's doing Cordo Maltese now. Um, oh, okay. And well, you know, uh, I love, I love, I love Eduardo Riso. Riso stuff yeah. is just so. And oh, he's an Argentinian. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 So it's funny when because I saw his stuff in 1990 when he was before he was in America because he was the assistant of some artist that Villagran knew. So I saw some stuff that he was doing for some of the publishers there oh, wow. before he came to the United States. So it's funny. I mean, you have all these uh other styles that people kind of forget about in America because we were sort of like, well, I don't know. Now we have a lot more styles because in the nineties, the image style kind of pushed everything down. And now it seems like 
there's all kinds of styles, you know, there's the yeah. manga style and, and yeah. people that are like the Belgian Japanese style, the Belgian manga style. Be well, I, and I think that's because like these sort of hiring artists from South America and Asia and, and the, and, you know, and in Europe, you know, that just had that sensibility that had never gone away like it did here, you know, and then that just raised the quality back up with regard to the storytelling and the drawing. Right. 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 You know, so, uh, so are you, are you, uh, are you developing more things to do yourself now? Is that what the yeah. kind of way you'd like to go? I mean, it's still occasionally partnering with other people, but would you like to develop like a, a, a line or a series of books yourself? Of yeah. Story? I mean, I think, yeah, I think the, the, the plan was always to tell my own stories. Um, you know, that, you know, things of course that I would have some ownership in and that's, that's, the most important thing, but it's also just to sort of like add something to just something to that, that sort of speaks to my voice. And I think the heavy was such a great um, opportunity to do that, you know? And so, you know, to sort of sit down and kind of write that out. And that was 160 pages. Um, uh, <laughs> that was 160 pages. Um, and I came in, I think about four pages under, you know, but it was just so fun to sort of write, characters and write scenes and and all that stuff and that's definitely what i want to do more and so right now i'm actually doing a lot of writing in addition to drawing so it's kind of i'm kind of like bouncing back and forth between writing here and then going back to the art table and drawing which is so, really so when you write for yourself we were talking to other people i'm always interested to see the process there do you think like comics or do you think like prose and then do you do that the prose into comics because like some people you know they type out the script and mm -hmm. then they go and draw but i know other artists who if they try to type the strip the script and then draw it's like and like it's that's not how their brain works yeah for me i always start with a yellow <laughs> legal pen yeah, yeah yeah i always start with like a yellow legal pad and i write it out by hand i just write the notes by hand, and I kind of figure out, okay, well, what's the story? What are the arcs? And then you kind of develop the characters, and then you kind of tie it together. And then once I have sort of a whole bunch of notes, then I'll start getting on like the computer and typing it up into a document. You know, I'm having like a, a really, really fun time because um, I'm going to be writing something for DC Comics. It's just something small, but it's really fun cracking this story because um, it, it involves new characters. And um, I'm not I'm not drawing it. I'm just writing it. Mm -hmm. But it was just really fun because that's how I started with just sort of notes, which were like, you know, just jotting down. Because a lot of times I have ideas and I, it's like I can't even keep up when I'm trying to write it down because they're just spilling out. So my notes will look like gibberish. But then once I kind of like break down what the story would be, what the arc would be, how these characters would fit together, then I just start tying it together. And then once I kind of have like a treatment and a synopsis laid out as the blueprint, then I'll go to the script. And so that's pretty much the way I work with the heavy where I gave John, cause when John Jennings first approached me to work with him on his, on his new line, I said, okay, I have an idea. Um, and so I, it was like a two page, uh, simple synopsis for the heavy. And so I gave that to John and John was like, Hey, I love this. Can you give me something? Can you develop this? So I kind of went away and I gave him like a, might have been like a 30 page treatment where I just kind of broke it really down scene by scene, act by act. And then they were like, okay, we, we, we love it. We did the deal. And then I had to write it based on that treatment, which is a really fascinating process because even though the treatment was so detailed writing the script, you know, I went in different directions from the treatment. Cause once you start getting into people's words and you start creating scenes then you're like, okay, well, I need more information here, or I don't need if I don't need this information. And what was really interesting is the way is the way my artist brain kicked in, because then I was like, because I was constantly editing, and I would always recommend it's all about editing things down. What do you need to say? And I would have a scene where I'm like, okay, that doesn't really need to be visualized because I just said it verbally, or vice versa, and just seeing that working together is just really just it was really awesome and so then once i had the script i just kept constantly revising that script constantly i'd write three scenes and then go back read through the scenes edit write more scenes and then when i had the final first draft 
I, you know, I sent it in and they pretty much greenlit it. I mean, I think they only had like some very minor notes, but they were like, okay, this is good. And it was funny because I was sharing it with John as I was writing it. So I would send him like scenes at a time and he was like, oh man, this is like a cliffhanger. Like I'm like, I want to see what's coming next. And so that was really awesome. So it's just been a really interesting process to sort of write, but also be thinking about the story from a visual standpoint as an artist, you know, and that's, that's really just fun, you know? So I really, I'm really enjoying writing, which is where I always wanted to go anyway. So then do you have a, uh, 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 after the, after the drawing is, I mean, the writing is done. Do you yeah. have a uh, visual development stage where you like a style <sighs> board or you pull in this, you kind of get your, you know, it's funny. Like with this, it was a little bit of, a, of an accelerated schedule. So I didn't have enough time. I didn't have a whole lot of time to sort of do, I guess, pre, pre-production or just sketching things out. So I would just kind of sketch, do very quick sketches of characters that I had in my mind's eye. Um, but then, but then I, but then I slipped into my typical way of drawing, which is to do layouts first. And so I'm trying to think. Let me see if I can. So like this is an example of like my layouts. Mm-hmm. Now, these will get very, these will vary from very tight layouts to like gibberish where they look like hieroglyphics. But this is probably like, like maybe like one of the more developed things because you can see I kind of started spotting blacks and everything else. But if I'm really moving fast, I'll just really just sort of just jot it out. Just, and I'll play with like the, the angles and the light. And then once I kind of tighten this up, um, now I don't, I don't have like a, a, a really tight version of storyboards, I mean, of layouts here, but that's pretty much my, my blueprint. And so I'm following those layouts when I'm doing the final pages and that's the process. Very cool. Um, oh, we're going to start wrapping, Sean, because uh, I am always very conscious of our guests' time. Listen, I- I'm here for you guys. So if we have questions, we can keep going. We can keep going. Okay. Unless it's very boring, you know, the, the, they can give me the hook. But I'm here for you guys if you want to keep going. I love it. I have a question. From, well, there's a lot of very nice comments. I'll get to the comments. But I have a question from our good friend Tim Fielder. Tim. Tim. Everybody knows Tim Fielder. That's the name of his new show. Everybody knows Tim <laughs> Uh, so Tim says for Sean, obviously a huge fan and disciple of your work. I'm fascinated by how you manage your interaction with the public and media. This is not an easy thing to do. How do you go about making sure you and your work stay out in the public eye? Also note, unlike Jamar, I appreciate an artist who was well dressed and engaging. <laughs> LOL. Thanks, Tim. Oh. So, so uh. how, how, how do you do it, Sean? How do you... How do you spin these plates and also do like public engagement and speaking and things like that? I think once again, this comes from when you hit a dry spell in your career as an artist and you have to sort of diversify and sort of get yourself in other mediums and make people aware of your work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, listen, I mean, I, I would study film, but I would also study TV. I would study just when people would do interviews like how they how they sound, how they look. Um, and I also felt that, you know, artists get a bad rap. We get, you know, and some of it's deserved, but, you know, people usually say, when you tell people you're an artist, they're like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And, oh, you're, you know, can I give you a dollar? Or you're broke or you're starving. Or I'm you're sorry flaky. for your loss, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know what I mean? Or you're flaky. And so one of the things I really realized is that, you know, if you kind of present yourself like a little bit more in a more sophisticated manner, then potential clients will take you seriously. And so for me, like I started putting on suits, you know, and, and so if I were meeting with a client and, um, you know, if you walk in and you're the artist, you walk in as a, with a suit on, you're going to confuse the hell out of them because they're going to think that you're an artist. And they're like, well, wait, are you real? Okay, who is this guy? And it's going to give you a little bit of an edge in terms of, you know, just negotiating or talking. And, and, and sort of, and once you sort of get in that kind of rhythm and you realize like one thing will lead to another. So if you get in the habit of speaking and doing things in public and, and trust me, like I, I know how we artists tend to be real hermits and a lot of us are socially awkward and I am as well. Um, and trust me, even though like I'm engaging here, 
I'm going to be quiet for like the next couple of hours and I want to be bothered with anybody because that's just the yin and the yang of it. But um, if, if you if you just sort of get yourself comfortable with talking and talking and just sort of like being out there, I think you'd be surprised how many people would like to hear from artists and hear about our process and hear about our stories. And, and I, it's funny because I will be, I could be in the most, you know, like corporate setting. And when people are like, oh, you draw comics? Yeah. yeah. Either they're a fan or their kid is a fan or their relatives of, is a fan. Yep. And yep. It, will, it, will, it will elevate me beyond like someone who's maybe like an investment broker or like a lawyer or something like that. Because they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've met those people before. But wait, you, 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 you worked on Batman? You, you did this? And then once you kind of have that, once you kind of have them kind of hooked, then you can get, then you can talk. Okay. You want, you want, you want, I was, we were talking about this right beforehand. I had, to, I bought this old book, mm -hmm. right? And those yeah. guys, whenever you see those old pictures of those old cartoonists, they always had suits on. <laughs> and they would wear suits when they went to the office because they're businessmen dealing with other businessmen. Yeah, yeah, and they didn't yeah. go up wearing like t-shirts, and <laughs> I mean the seventies, that all changed, right? With that generation yeah. of guys that came in, sure, they wore t-shirts because that's what the, the 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 culture was then. But mm -hmm. you're right; I think when you're dealing with businessmen, you're a business, you're and your business is your art, and you have to deal with it like a business, not as an artist at that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think that when you start, when you put yourself in the business person mold, then that bleeds into other areas like negotiating, talking about money, because a lot of, because that's something else they don't teach you about in art school at all with regard to negotiating and being, not being afraid to ask for money, you know, not being able to, because we're not taught that. And so, so for like me, like, I think I just got into this whole <laughs> blowing up my spot now, but I, I got into this whole thing of just sort of negotiating for sport, you know, and I started watching TV shows where people would negotiate. Like I love like million dollar listing. Like if anybody ever watches Bravo and they, they have those realtors that go around and, you know, they're just making these deals. And if you get yourself into this sort of comfortable space where you can talk about business the same way you could talk about, well, is the thing stronger than the Hulk? You know, who, you know, the same way you can talk about those kind of goofy fanboy things, talk about, okay, well, contract wise, what's the percentage here? What are we doing here? Blah, blah, blah. Do you, you know, ever feel something. like that part of it is also with jealousy, uh, artists' is jealousy? Because there's also an element of that too. Like people don't want to talk about money because then they find out somebody's making more money than they sure. and, oh, and, Yeah. I mean, and that's, and that's legitimate though, because I mean, you don't want to be telling everybody what you make because that that can be used against you you know what i mean so you have to be slick and you know but but i think that um for me like i'm always happy to share information when whenever like you know i i meet an aspiring artist or even like a colleague and they're like hey what do you think about this or can i get your advice and for me it's like i've i've been learning i've been given information by people and so that's that's what it's all about, just sort of learning and getting better and sharing what you know with other people. Because if you're like someone who's just sort of, you know, really kind of like all insecure and I don't want to, I don't want to put this person on over here because they might threaten me, then you're really saying that you're not secure in yourself. You know what I mean? Or I, I don't want to share my contacts with this person over here because that might take away work for me. Then you need to step up your game. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a problem if, if if Brett was like, "Hey, Sean, can you introduce me to so and so over here?" I'd be like, "Okay." I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of Brett's work. Or same thing with you, Mike, or even Jamar. You know, Jamar, and I don't mean to say even Jamar, but you know what I mean. But like, if Jamar were to say, "Like, hey, Sean, like, you know, can you introduce me to like some guy that you know at Marvel or DC?" As long as like you're not a psycho, yeah, yeah, sure, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Here's the intro. Now, now take it from there. Yeah, I think in the old days, a lot of people were like don't share contacts because they were like, that guy's going to take your job. Like that old world thing was like, that guy's going to take your job. And I yeah. know some teachers mm -hmm. don't because they feel that the student is going to be competition. Right. So, yes. but of course, if your student is better than you, 
That's not that's not the student's <laughs> fault. Yeah. And eventually somebody's going to replace you. So if it's not your student, someone's going to be better than you. So you know what? Step up your game. And then and that's what it should be about. But I think that there is a lot of jealousy. There are, there are a lot of people that are bitter. You know, I mean, I, I think I've been pretty fortunate that I haven't really come across too many people. Not that I'm saying that they don't exist, but of course they do. But I, maybe I just don't see them because I don't have time for it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like it, like it's it's sad for me. Like there have been a couple of people in this industry that I've met that I was a really big fan of that were dicks. And I'm like, oh, man, really? Yeah. Damn, man. Damn. Like I was such a big fan of yours and you're a dick. Oh, shoot. You know, and, and that's disappointing. Oh, but yeah. I think but 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 those are far and few between the people that I've met in this industry, you know, from people that whose work I grew up reading to fellow colleagues are just like, hey, man, like this is a family like, you know, we're, we're like in this together. And if we can share, if we can help, blah, 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 you know. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and someone, someone wrote, you have to worry about who you recommend, and that's very true. That's why I said you can't be a psycho. Now, now, you know, because some people will say, hey, listen, Sean, I heard what you said on that podcast. Now, can I get an intro to somebody over at DC Comics or Skybound? And no, like, if I don't know you, I can't just sort of give out information like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah. And, even, yeah and even coming forward, because I've had this with students mm -hmm. who – are too familiar or might be a little rude or a little assuming yeah. and that that sort of tells you that the person doesn't ha think or have borders you know yeah there's a certain yeah. hierarchy of way you do things whenever i teach whenever i do like give lectures at schools i always tell the kids listen i am happy to answer any question you have but i have two caveats number one i'm not your friend so don't email me saying hey what's up or don't email saying, hey, what would you think of the most recent Superman movie? I, yo, like, yo, yo, having, yo, Sean, yo, Sean, yo, yeah, yo. Yeah. No, yeah, we're not, we're not having that conversation. Yeah. But, and don't ask me, don't ask me something that you could have easily Googled because you just wasted my time. So I will, I'm happy to give you any information that you can't find on your own. And don't bug me about silly things because we're not friends. We're, we're not cool like that. But, you know what, but if you have, if, if you're coming to me with like a legitimate question, about something I'm happy to share, you know what I mean? And that's something else going to like the whole rec, you know, you have to be careful with who you recommend and also why I started wearing a suit and so why I sort of wanted to sort of project a professional image is that um, it, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's about credibility mm -hmm. because I think something that we artists have is that a lot of times we'll give artists credibility because of how t talented they are, but in terms of their art, but when you get outside of comics and you start meeting people that don't know anything about comics, they don't know who's hot, they don't know who's good or whatever, they're going to be assessing you on who you are. And that's why I've, I've always been sort of conscious of, okay, well, if I speak here, then I'm going to add that to my bio. My website is very clean. I'm not really talking recklessly on social media unless mm -hmm. that's what you want your Facebook page to be. If you want your Facebook page to be, hey, man, like, you know, like, like that that last you know that 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 uh justice league movie was trash man i can't stand it like the snyder cut is bullshit if, that, if that's what you want to have on your page that's fine but then you can't also be doing business with that because you're gonna you're gonna blow up your spot so you mm -hmm. have to make that decision about how you want to present yourself i almost feel like this even especially with comic book creators they need media training oh totally well, most people do. Like you're looking now at how many people, like how many people are doing racist things and then literally telling on themselves by posting the video. <laughs> so, I'm like, so, so it's like, okay, yeah. okay, so you're doing something either really racist or really illegal or illegal and racist and you're posting the video and now your life is destroyed. So clearly you're not wrapping your brain around this whole social media thing. <laughs> and, you know, you're not getting this. And also, like you said, some people will come at you like very casually, like, hey, Sean, like, what's going on? Like, I'm like, I don't know you. Like, so mm -hmm. if you're going to come to me and you're going to you're going to come to me because, hey, you want some information or you want a tip then you have to come to me professionally. Well, hello, I'd like to introduce myself. Do you have some time? That's good. That's good. But right, like you right. said, there's some there's some people that are just really whacked out. They have no media training or they have no manners and they don't get it. And they don't understand that 
that old adage is that old adage of you only get you know what the one chance to make a first impression or wait what's the right. You know, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just, just, yeah. I think, I think, I think, I think social media makes it, makes it very easy for people because of the, the casual nature of it, mm-hmm. right? Makes it easy for people just to be as casual with a professional as they are with their friends because there's no, there's no boundaries, there's no walls, there's no, um, yeah. And I think that uh, uh, I always think about like the older generation of guys would not argue as much on like I can't imagine that even though maybe Stan Lee and Jack Kirby had some disagreements, they would not be arguing on social media about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah I, you're not going to. And listen, I'm I'm the most argumentative person on the planet. You know what I mean? Like I will argue you for an hour and then say, you know what, Mike, you're right. You know, because and that's just how I can be. But I'm not going to do that on so because number one, I don't have time to do that, and it's it's, it's, it's you know what I mean. And 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 I'll kind of and I'll kind of like make my point, hear what you have to say, and then that's it. I'm done. I got work to do. I don't have time for this. You know. Mm-hmm. I think that when you see people just you know kind of going back and forth, although I, I have seen some really good arguments. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of like lurk and like watch other people's arguments. I'm like, that was pretty entertaining. So I can't, I'm not going to be judgmental like that. Because sometimes someone might really just push your button and you really want to engage, you know. But I, but, but those are, usually those are professionals that are doing that. Like people that have careers, right. that, you know what I mean? They're not going to, they're not trying to break in and make a first impression. Right. You know what I mean? So I think when I see like these young people that are like not in the industry just really being like rude to like working veterans or people out there i'm like are you have you lost your mind you're not you're not quite getting this yeah. i have i, I, I have, they don't have antenna their antenna is just not developed they don't seem to be able to read situations no well i think i think there's that point brett and i also think there's like the the social mores of being so close to people with social media, like say you're uh, a, a friend of Sean's on Facebook. Now you know Sean in your head. So okay. now when when you see him at a show, you get real casual when you approach him and then you get your feelings hurt, right? Well, and, and I've had people say, hey man, I saw that vacation. You just, you just came back from like the Bermuda Triangle, man. That was awesome. And I'm like, oh, you know what? But then I can't get mad because I put it, I put that out there. You know, so it goes both ways. Right. yeah, it goes both ways. So I'm like, oh, okay, you saw what I posted. So, okay, cool. But, you know, but then you have certain people that just live on social media and they think that every, they think that they have the whole story based on what someone has posted because I don't, I don't share like the majority of my life on social media, even though people might think I do, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So you yeah, share one, one, only one part of your, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, any kind of any kind of presentation that is uh, based on decorum has a kind of dichotomy where you want to be honest and sincere about yourself, but you almost have to have a public character through mm-hmm. which you communicate. Yeah, uh, you can't just completely be yourself all the time. It's uh, it's just not practical, and as you say, it can lead to a lot of misunderstandings. Yeah. Do you have, do you teach at all, Sean? Do you do you do any teaching? No, I I I. I love talking with at school. I mean, I've done a lot of lectures at schools and I've given you know many talks, but I don't, I don't teach. I just don't have the time to devote to it, you know, and, and, and cause I've been asked and I, I'm really am honored and, and, you know, that people would want me to teach, but I just, you know what I mean? Like when you're drawing pages, you know, and you, you're on a schedule, it's like you, you barely have time for like a social life, let alone to add, let alone adding something like that. And that's a big commitment, you know? Yeah. It is. It is. Uh, Joe has a quick question going back to the social media thing. And I'm not exactly sure if Joe is joking at this point, but he says, so social media is your best public face. But I think the way we all use this stuff now is this is your thor- thoroughfare, your through fair to fans and other people is, you know, your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram. Right. And I think you create a persona over time, mm-hmm. like just how Sean said, this is the kind of stuff you post. This is what people kind of att- attribute to your personality. So yeah. sometimes there's a disconnection when they meet you in real life. 
you know, like I remember not to throw out names, but I remember Evan Dorkin, like before all of this had this, not to him, but he had a reputation. Like everybody thought he was milk and cheese. <laughs> right. So they would these dudes would come up to him at shows and they would say it was really slick stuff to him or try to curse him out and like laugh about it. Like, yo, milk and cheese, F you. Uh, and he's just like, what is wrong with you people? Yeah. You know what on. I mean? So there has to be a disconnection between all of that and just like to be human, right? Like be a good person. Yeah. And and, and also I think that I and I would always study you know, um, um, performers. And I think that there was something very interesting about not really talking when you don't have anything to say. Mm. So, you know, I mean, you invited me, you invited me to come on and I really, I appreciate that. But like right now, like I'm like, okay, well, I really wouldn't just go out and just start talking about just random stuff because sometimes going away is actually a good thing. You know, I mean, if you think about before social media started, like when Michael Jackson or Madonna or, you know, the Rolling Stones would drop an album. They would they would go away after they, if they put the album out. They milk it for about three or four singles. They do a concert tour and then they went away for a year. Mm-hmm. And you never really heard from them. You know what I mean? And then they would come back like brand new. They'd have some kind of new thing that they were doing. And and I get it with social media. Like you know, people can't really go away, or at least certain artists feel if I go away, then I'll be forgotten. So I have to right. constantly be feeding. Well, because there's a big churn now. I mean, there's, I mean, and now yeah. because of the pandemic, the churn is like even greater than it was even just yeah. four months ago. Yeah, yeah. So, so for me, like, I'm like, okay, well, you know, when I have something to sort of talk about or something, or like when the projects that I'm involved in get to the point where I can talk about them, I'll talk about them. But mm-hmm. you know, but you know, but but then, but then, because you have to worry about sort of getting addicted to sort of being always trying to say something and posting something and be just be, you know, wacky or interesting. I'm like, I don't, I don't got time for that. I think younger artists probably are affected by that more because, sure. you know, how many likes you get on Instagram. I put this up. Nobody liked it. it must, <laughs> not be, must not be very good, right? Because then you see other people, they fucking suck, man. They're terrible. And they got a million likes and they got three million followers. Well, my stuff is better than that. Why, you know? I I know that yeah. affects the current generation of artists more than it affected us because we developed completely outside of that whole fishbowl. Yep. Right. And so yeah. there are artists that are getting hired because of their social media because they got a lot of likes. Right. People yeah. are scouring. Uh, people in Hollywood are looking at Instagram, looking at Twitter to find artists. So like the way even artists are. De- are seeing now is because of your social media mm-hmm. and, their, and the perception of how cool or popular you are on your social media, which again is some form of smoke and mirrors because you can see somebody, they might have a lot of people, they might have a lot of likes. You think, oh, this is very interesting. That doesn't mean they can do your job or work with you or work in sure. a social situation with other artists or are on time or reliable or anything yeah. like that, but they've got, you know, three million people following them. But see, and, and you're right. I, but I, but but doesn't really. I don't. But it doesn't apply to comics, though. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that Marvel's hiring someone because they had like a whole lot of followers if they suck. Mm. I mean, I mean, real. I mean, you know what I mean? You can have a whole lot of followers, but if you really, if you're, if you can't draw, I don't know if if if, if they're going to be trying to hire you. Yeah, I don't know. I still see some people that I don't think can draw. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, don't, I just, I mean, I, I see it in other mediums, but I guess, I guess, the, but then maybe it's the people that I follow because for Instagram, you know, I tend to follow artists and, and hot women, but I'm just wacky like that. So, right. I mean, but, um, you know, and so like, I, so I have this sort of like visual feed going through, but, but, you know, but the people that like I follow that are, that are, that are artists are really good. So I'm like, okay, I get it. Why? Like they would have all these hits, you know what I mean? So it's, it's an interesting thing to to navigate. Um, But, but I, but the interesting thing about social media is that it's such an equalizer that we didn't have when we were trying to get work because we had to Xerox copies of our stuff and either mail them in, or try to get a meeting. If you lived in the city, you, you, you try to weasel your way in the offices and linger around to try to get work and laugh at dumb jokes to get work. You know, 
go to a convention, wait on a line. But these days, if you just have like a, a page where you can put your stuff, you know, you can you can get work like that, which is pretty cool. So yeah. how much how much time would you say that you put into your your social media, and how do you construct that? Do you say now I'm in the hut, and I'm in the cave, and I'm working, and then I will then when I'm done, I will then devote my time to the social media, or do you you know do you how do you yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm not a slave to it. Yeah, like I'm not I'm not a slave to it. Like I like for my Twitter, I just really retweet other things that I find interesting because I I really don't have the patience to be that clever within like 180 characters. I, you know, I don't I'm, I'm just not that I don't have the patience for that. And mm -hmm. and and for my Twitter, I tend to follow a lot of news people, a lot of journalists. So that's really a news kind of a, a source. Facebook, Instagram, you know, I'll post like okay, like I went biking today and I took some photos by the White House. I'll post that. Um, I'll, I'll post what, I, what I've been doing since I really can't post artwork, you know, now because it's it's I can't share that stuff. I'll post what's on in my studio. So if you go to my Instagram, you know, you'll you'll see like what I've been watching for like the last couple of days, and and people are like, wait, you're watching all this stuff at the same time? I'm like, no, I'm just showing you my my sort of train of thought in terms of like, okay, I just watched this movie. This made me think about that movie. That made me think about that movie, and so that's what I'll kind of post. Right. So you, spiral, so you, right? so you can show old process, but not new process, probably, right? Like, yeah, well, yeah, like I mean, like the stuff that I'm working on now, I can't, I can't share, because you know it hasn't been published yet, you know. So what I'll do is I might go back and and say, hey, here's a process thread on uh, a sequence from Thief of Thieves or like past work and people really seem to enjoy that so i was going to start doing that a little bit more because they like when i would post like a sequence of like an, an action sequence and i would sort of explain like what my thinking was with regard to the angles and the lighting <clears throat> and what's really fun is that when i was doing this with thief of thieves <clears throat> andy diggle who wrote if he wrote what i was if he wrote this the um scripts that i was that i had drawn he'll post the scripts ah, which is pretty okay. cool so people will say, oh, wow, we can really compare what Sean translated. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, Brett. The check is in the mail, Brett. check is in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> Wish I could get used to this reverse angle. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll probably do like, I'll probably do a few more of those process threads. Hmm. Um, I was going to ask, and this might be a silly question since we spent the whole episode talking about physical uh drawing like you know tool to surface but do you have any type of digital throughput in your in your uh workflow sean like are you using photoshop at all or clip studio paint for any pro part of the process besides scanning or maybe cleaning up work like do you do any digital inking or anything like that nope i'm i am completely old school mm -hmm. brush mm -hmm. Here's a crow quill. What's that? <laughs> Which end do you use? <laughs> here's, here's, people ask me this all the time. Like this is like my bottle of ink that I like. These mm -hmm. oh, that flows really well. Yeah. 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 Because I'm always on. I'm, I've always been searching for like a really dark, dark black, black ink um, that'll 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 be almost black when it when it comes time to um, you know um, print. Well, that mm -hmm. I think only that brand and the the current Pelican uh, are the only two that don't have an acrylic binder, either, which gums up your brushes. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I find that if I keep rinsing my brushes, well, actually, you know what? I used to have this problem with my brushes where they would start splitting after a few uses, and I found that if I I, I just need to swap out my um, rinse jar mm -hmm. more frequently, and then that'll sort of uh, uh, give me more time with the brushes. I also, you know, I also I found I, a way of cleaning them uh, from a guy who did a Dick Blick thing where you take, I don't wear my brushes, but um, you take the brush, right. you put the soap on it, and here's the ferrule, and you wiggle the brush part. You wiggle that, yeah. because what that'll do is it'll work the dried ink out of the ferrule. Which is okay. what causes your brush to split. Split. Okay. Then you then you wash it uh, with um, shampoo, 
put it back to a point and let it dry. Wait, wait, wait. So what's the soap? What kind of soap are you using? You can use any, you know, any, you know, Prel, like dish whatever. Soap? Dish, dish soap. Dish soap works okay. really well. Um, okay. uh, the stuff that has the acrylic binder in it, what I would do is I would take a little cap of rubbing alcohol and roll my brush in there for a second. And then oh. the uh, alcohol will, dis will uh, dissolve the acrylic binder. Okay. Then you wash it with the warm, not hot, warm soap and water, and you again you wiggle, you wiggle the, you can hold the the uh, the uh, the hair and wiggle the bat, and if you do that, you actually see the dirt coming out. You see, wash see, that like, three, four, three like or four you're times. Me, you're making me feel really bad because like when they just split, I just throw them out. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so there's, actually, a land, you know there's there's a landfill now with your brushes I, in it, right? Well, actually, you know what happens though? They kind of like work their way down the the um, priority. So, like, I have like the brush that's kind of doing okay, and then when it starts splitting, like that's something that I'll use for like just to sort of spot the blacks or do big big bold areas. And then, do you ever use a split brush to do like a rough edge or a dry brush edge? No, I usually use like a regular brush, but then it's just sort of like trying to get the ink just the right consistency where it will break. Right. Yeah. Man, yeah. man. But, but to answer your question, Jamar, no, I don't. Um, I don't use Photoshop with anything um, other than just sort of to, to scan it in or clean up certain things. Okay. Uh, well, this uh, question came up a while ago. Uh, uh, you're you crunching. Have... You're crunching. I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, I, le I learned that uh, that brushed cleaning technique from a guy who was doing demos for Grumbacher um, okay. because oil it's its oil is even more difficult to get out of a brush after a while. You can buy a real nice $50 yeah. brush and yeah. you want to clean it really well. So, um, and I was not always, when I was in school, or even now, so I was always a little hard on my brushes, but I found that if I did that, I actually brought back some old um, uh, brushes that were like that were kind of splitting, but you can clean them. Oh, you, might wow. have to, you might have to do it three or four or five times to really get what's inside out, but you can bring a brush back. Well, see, yeah, like if I'm, you, you know, what do you use for white? Do you use the, the Presto or do you use something in a brush? Yes, I do the Presto. Those are the best. They're getting, then, they're, they're getting hard to find. And then... Yeah, I usually stock up. A, I usually stock up on on these for like you know at least three or four at a time, like three three packs, and then I use this for like the brush. Mm. Oh, the pro white, yeah. The pro white. So if I want to get like a really kind of thin, because this this is good, but if you want to get like a really thin like brush stroke, mm -hmm. I use like a brush with the pro white. I have terrible luck with that stuff getting hard in the bottle. That's the problem. Yeah, like because and honestly, like. I don't even want to open this up because I'll be pissed off if it's dry. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of times you have to just do it really tight. Or, and you know what I'll do? Just kind of revise it if it has dried out. I'll put some water, shake it, and then just sort of pour the water, the excess water out and then kind of stir it up and you can kind of get it going again. Get a good soup. I've, I've actually given up. I just use um, gouache now. I use white gouache. I have. Oh, and is I it have. solid? It's, it's, it's opaque? Oh yeah, well, I, I use a, there's a really great brand. Uh, what, all their paint is good, but it's um, Graham M Graham, and the okay. bottom here is honey. They use it's it's honey that gives it this really lush sort of gummy quality. Um, yeah. And you put it right down to a hair, and it'll stay it'll stay white. And the, actually, know. it's nice to work over. It has a nice surface if you want to put another line on top of it. I was going to ask you that. that was my next question. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. Oh. I'll show you what it looks like. <laughs> okay. And I have yeah. these. These are the new. These are the new uh, knockoff Prestos. Uh, well, wait, these, wait, what, wait, what? Are, those, are those cheaper? Is that why you got them, or you couldn't find yeah. the Prestos? Well, I know. Well, the Prestos are getting harder to find, and uh, I do product reviews in Draw Magazine, so I pick oh. these up. These are Kugels. This is a new brand, a oh. German brand. That's one. Kugel friend and Ali. Kugel friend and Ali. That's the one. That's the one. Amazon. You could buy a whole case of these for like thirteen bucks. And they work. Yeah. Could you uh, hold it up again, uh, Jamar? What are they? How do you spell that? Oh, it's a uh, cool Kugels K U G E L Z. 
K-U-G-E-L-Z. All right. Yeah. yeah. The Prestos are really, they're really great. Just even, especially when I'm doing like layouts and just really like quick stuff. They're really, really good. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. The yeah. gouache. Yeah. And that wow. the Graham brand is really fantastic. I mean, if you ever wanted to use it just for painting, all of their paint is really beautiful. Jeez, I haven't used gouache. I haven't touched gouache in freaking forever, man. Like I've been, I've been so meaning to sort of break out and 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 do some watercolors because I've been working in black and white for so long. And I was so close about maybe six years ago where I actually bought some acrylics and I was going to paint, and then I just never got around to it. So. Mm -hmm. And and me, I I just don't make mistakes. So I buy one of these just for using whiteout for ink, and I don't even put it out. I just open the tip. You just, you just dip, put just dip the brush in. Wow, really? Tap it back up. Yeah. Okay, that's good. All right, all right. It doesn't dry out on the on the palette. You know. Wow. Wow. We're in really old school here for all the viewers, for all you young whippersnappers. This is old school. That's right. Uh, that's right. Or hand. or you take your uh, digital pen and you use the eraser. What the hell is that? It did. That's a digital pen. <laughs> this is the pen. This is my pen for my Cintiq. Oh my god. So. Uh, there was a question. Okay. My digital pen is from the original one, and uh, this thing I bought in two thousand nine. It's fell fallen apart so many times. It's taped together. Jesus, it still works. So. Man, it's like the mummy. <laughs> <laughs> it's slow, lumbering, but it still gets. Well, it has it will still get. I get yours does too. It has a knob on it that you can use oh. to choose effects but over time it just fell apart and fell out so i taped up the hole so my finger wouldn't get stuck in it <laughs> aww, aww. Now, th th thank you suzanne that's awesome and yeah those those artist editions are really really great like i i have the uh i have a mazzucchelli the i one of the awesome things and i i wanted to get around to scanning this or taking a photo of it because um i remember i ran to walt simonson at a con and i, I said hey walt i've been meaning to buy your artist edition and yeah, I've got, it's on my list to get because you know what? You know, I love your stuff. And he was like, I'll take care of you. <laughs> and I forgot about it. Then maybe about like a month or two, I got like this package in the mail and he had sent me a copy of his artist edition. And I'm, I'm hope I'm not blow up, blowing up world spots. So everyone's going to hit, hit him up for like free copies of this. So I'm going to well, listen through this. all the time. He's probably in the room right now. <laughs> so, so I'm, um, I'm flipping through it. I'm just like, oh my god, this is amazing! But this, the first page, is this big forehead, and it said, uh, you know, hey Sean, here you go, my pal. And I was like, holy shit! Like, how did he get this printed in the artist <laughs> edition book? Because it looks so perfect. Like, it looked like it was printed. <laughs> and 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 my friend was like. Sean, he sketched that in there for you. And I'm like, oh, I, but it looked like it just, it looked like it had been printed. Like that's just how dope Walt is. So he did you know, a, was, in my, yeah. in my copy of alien, he did the most beautiful drawing oh. of alien. Uh, just, yeah, just, and I don't even know if he penciled it. I'll have to go back and look. It's just like you say, so flawless. The man is a genius. He is a genius. The, like the, the, the lines, the variance is just bananas. Hey, hey, Sean, there's uh, one more question from, from Suze or Ringo, sure. and then she's going to bed. Uh, she said, uh, Sean, are your films available for viewing somewhere? You know what? They're not because, like, the thing is, we shot – I shot those back in, like, the mid early millennium, so that's before HD. So, you know, they would look pretty horrendous if you were to, like, play them now. They would look kind of rough. But I, I thought about maybe – posting like one of the like the later shorts so mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll see if i can get around to maybe posting one and see you know i'll, I'll post and, and take the abuse and see what people think <laughs> cool all right well let's wrap this up sean you've been a great guest right. thank you for uh giving of your evening uh to talk to the fellas um i hope you uh had a good good chat and you know it's always good to chop it up a little bit right no, guys, listen, it's been a pleasure. This has been really cool, especially, I mean, even if it, if I wasn't, if we weren't stuck in the house during the Rona, it would be just kind of cool just hanging out with you yeah. guys. So it's been, really, it's been a pleasure. So it's been awesome. And, you know, thank you so much for having me on. Are we sure we got all the questions? We got all the questions? I think so. But I will, yeah. before you go, where can people find you on social media? So you can look me up, Sean Martin, bro, on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter at 
S. Martin Bro, my last name. Very cool. All right. Yep. Thank you so much, Sean. And I hope that we can have you back on in the near future. Yeah, when you, when your books when your books come in, when is when is your next project coming out? Yeah. When 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 will you see that? Well, you know, I well, I think that the heavy's not gonna come out to twenty twenty one. So that we got time for that. Um I should be able to so that I should be having some things that I'm going to talk about hopefully within the next month. I can I can announce those. So that will that will come out before heavy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some things that that have been taking a while to sort of like just sort of like nail down the freaking like the contracts, but like you know, but I'll be able to talk. But yeah, but but yeah, maybe like the next month I'll be able to like to reveal. And heavy will be early twenty one, mid twenty one, <laughs> end of twenty one. I think, well, because things got pushed back because of the Rona. So I think we're looking, hopefully, I think they're trying to get it out by maybe summer, summer of 2021 for San Diego. Hopefully, if there's a San Diego next year. And so but, when, will, when will you have to be done? I need to be done by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I need to be done by the end of this year. So. Get to work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, he, then he can't do the podcast. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm sure my editor is looking at this saying, what the, what is he doing? What the, what is he doing? Yeah. This is great press. We're, we're really huge. I don't know if you do that. There you go. All right. All right go. Sean, thanks so much, man. You have a great yeah, night. Yeah. Nice cool. to meet you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Same here, guys. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right. All right have a good night, bro. Right, take care. I kicked him out. That's my favorite part. <laughs> yeah. My favorite you part just your hand hovering over the button any moment you will disappear i i miss having a physical phone that you can hang up on people like that that was just very satisfying well you could have one it just wouldn't have anybody at the other end. you could just well what you can do is just get an old phone and just hit the cutoff button on your computer <laughs> just smash your keyboard on your computer with your phone but yeah, uh, uh, Sean's a great guest, and uh, like I said, I think he's he's such a uh, well seasoned uh, member of the comic book community. And you know, this is what we do: we spotlight our buddies, right? So I think everybody got something from that. And you know, he's his work is magnificent. So please, if you're not already a fan of Sean, you should start tonight. Don't, go go don't, to Amazon and buy everything. Don't forget that all the really cool people wear shirts with collars too. Mm. I don't have a collar. <laughs> I, I this is a, I got this one just for the podcast. Oh, is that your podcast shirt? This is this is I think this is oh, this, this is like a speed racer shirt. Yeah. <laughs> you look like you work at a golf shop. Yeah. Uh, like a, I should maybe this is a bit of trivia. I don't wear t-shirts because uh I can't stand anything touching my neck right there. Mm. And I think it's because when I was six years old I actually was put in a straight jacket. Really, Brett? I yeah, I guess that's. I can't. I, I just can't stand it. Um, what, what about like a deep V neck T shirt? Yeah, that I can deal with. Yeah, but not the not the tight. I don't. Want uh, I thought a, it was. I thought it was because they hung you and your neck was broken, but you didn't <laughs> die. <laughs> the sleepwalker. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, I. Uh, well, this this would never happen now. This must have been about nineteen. I guess sixty three. I was preschool. I was. Uh, we were visiting a, um, some friends of my parents, and he had a, a three pieces of sheet metal laying on top of a garbage can, like as a lid to keep, I guess, raccoons out or something. Mm -hmm. I ran by it, and it sliced my eye open. It sliced my eyelid open so I could see the light, but it didn't touch my eyeball. Oh, my God. Three cuts. And uh, so a lot of dramatic stuff happened after that. But, but when the uh, ambulance showed up, I was so terrified that they put me in a straitjacket. And I had to ride in the back of this ambulance. Uh, they wouldn't let my mom go with me either. It was terrifying. Yeah, so, because, because you wouldn't calm down? You wouldn't go yeah. with them? Well, yeah. also, between the time I was cut and the doctors showed up, they were feeding me Mountain Dew. So I was well, that, that, oh, always stops, that always stops bleeding, right? Mountain Dew? <laughs> it's, a, it's a blood clotting agent. Yeah, yeah, really? You know. So I mean that's how much, much people knew about it in those days, but and that's all, and that's a glass bottle of Mountain Dew. Yeah, that's the yeah, old school, the old uh, guy with the shotgun running around on the label. <laughs> <laughs> Remember well, that? You know, that's gone. There goes my history. My history of Mountain Dew man. I'm very upset. 
<laughs> I'm very upset. My 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 fake my fake culture. How dare you? How dare uh, you, Mountain Dew? Well, you know what, you know what's odd though is I can wear turtlenecks in the in the winter. If it's up here, I'm okay. But if it touches me there, I'm just that's like, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I'm going to wrap this up. I think this was a very nice episode, and it was a nice respite, uh, not a respite, a nice return from after our Fourth uh, of July break. Yeah, that was so we we were just all just like laying down, not doing anything, just so quiet. Uh, yeah, and you know, I think now that we're we've been doing these for a little bit, it's become a habit, right? It's kind of like I'm counting in yeah. between shows. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, no, is it Wednesday yet? Yeah. It's a habit. Is it, is yeah, it Saturday it. yet? Um, you know, I need I need some pencil to pencil. The modern uh, situation we're in here, where the timing, you know, the weekly deadlines, everything's been up, upside down. I, I never actually know what day it is. Mm. I just don't think about it in those terms. So I, I sometimes forget that they're coming up. It, it's hard. You got to have to kind of like break up your week so you have some separation, right? Yeah, I always, I always know what day it is. I, I mean, uh, you, you have to if you're delivering your strips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So I want to give a, a a quick shout out, and then we're going to go home. Um, a big shout out to our sponsor, Clip Studio Paint, and also to Tomorrow's Publishing. Uh, please check out the products. Uh, we will be back on Saturday with Scott Christian Sava, um, director and animator and cartoonist and He's going to be talking about uh, his career and also his new uh, animated feature, Animal Crackers, that's going to be debuting on Netflix later this month. Very excited to talk to him. We might have some other special guests along with him, uh, but that gives us a lot to look forward to. So for Brett, Mike, and myself, uh, I'm Jamar Nicholas. Thanks for watching Pencil to Pencil. You have a good night, and remember to wash your hands. Bye. And don't touch Brett's neck. <laughs> Good don't, night. Wa don't wash your neck. <laughs>